Okay, it's uh, now 2 p.m. So ah, let, let's just wait um, actually a few minutes to see uh, if we have any people coming late. Uh, in the meantime, please uh, set up your R studio, you know, um, working directories and all of that. Uh, load, uh, don't load the data uh, to, to your folders. So yeah, um, make sure that your working directory is set up correctly. I just changed mine because I forgot to do it earlier. Um, also, let me share the, the code share link for you. All the, all the codes are already there, so you can just uh, open the link and, and download the, the, the codes, put it in a fresh, um, in a fresh uh, R script, and yeah, you'll be, you'll be ready to go. Um, today we're going to uh, have tutorial 11, but there wasn't a tutorial 10. Tutorial 10 was merged. Like the topics that we usually discuss in tutorial 10 were merged with the ones that we usually discussed in tutorial 11 into a unified tutorial 11, right? So you're not missing anything if you don't see like tutorial 10 anywhere or something like that. Um, the topic for today is BAR models. Uh, again, we're just going to wait for people to to come. Maybe they're running in a little bit late, but yeah, just uh, to clarify that there's no mistake or anything like that. Um, Unfortunately, we couldn't have the tutorial last week uh, due to the lecture recordings for the topics of lecture 10 not being ready in time. So Eric decided to push the tutorials back uh, one week. Um, but here we are. Um, you probably noticed as well that I have disallowed the option to unmute. Uh, this is due to an incident that happened a few weeks back, um, which is um, made me had to, uh, no, not a few weeks back, a few days back actually, but maybe I had to to edit the recording quite extensively, uh, and it was quite weird. So if you have any comments to make, please, uh, like put any reaction button put it in the chat, like, hey, Will, I have a question, and I'll stop and, and I will uh, uh, allow you to, to unmute just, just because of that, please. Um, so yeah, for those of you that uh, just arrived, let me put the um, code, the, the code share link in, in the chat. Um, please don't delete anything from it, just copy. Today's tutorial, I'm, I'm sorry. I am um, confident that it, 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 won't, it won't be too long, uh, but yeah, we, we'll see how, how we go. Um, I, I'm actually going to, to grab water in here in, 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 let's just wait for a minute for people coming. So yeah.
Okay, um, we can start now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Um, so today we're going to discuss BAR models. These models are uh, useful to capture interdependencies among multiple time series. Um, this, these models are explained as if you think of a system of equations, a system of uh, yeah, system of equations that explain a, a multiple time series uh, simultaneously, right? So all the time series are assumed to to be endogenous. Uh, so they are explained by lacks of the other variables and, and itself. Um, and these um, and these equations are estimated uh, jointly, right? So um, let me see. Oh yeah, no. And uh, BAR models. Oh, before I forget, BAR models are like the most refined models that uh, that are not Bayesian that uh, can be used to to forecast time series. So these are quite advanced. These are quite. Um, like at some point, I went the benchmark in 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 time series work before um, before the 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 Bayesian um, uh, work uh, became like as popular as it is right now. But these models are quite great, um, and I'm going to show you why they are like um, as useful as they are. So let's start by actually I forgot to mention this a bit earlier. Uh, let's start by uh, installing the packages BARs and Pragma. So if you don't have those packages, you can check on your list. Um, I already have them here, so I'm not going to install them. But if you don't have them, please uh, use the install button here. Just type BARs, press install, then come back again. Let's uh, type Pragma, press install, and give it a two minutes. It will install it. Um, and uh, we need to activate the packages. So I'm going to run these two, these three library commands. You know, we always do. And uh, yeah, just before we start. So the plan for today is that we're going to learn how to uh, create a set or estimate a set of BAR models. Um, the loops for today are not going to be as complicated as we had uh, previously. Uh, like I'm going to show you how what, what's the the what's the selection process and all of that. Um, and then we are going to analyze the dynamic relationships between the variables. So we can do that as well with. Um, with the with the uh, with the flexibilities that the BAR models allow, so we're going to use the money underscore dem dot csv data frame. Uh, it contains quarterly observations from 1959 to 2001 of these four variables: real GDP in the U.S., nominal GDP. A money supply and a three month B, a rate on US Treasury bills. So that's an interest rate from monetary policy um, there as well. And we're going to use that information to calculate the log of the real GDP and the log of the real money supply. And in order to calculate that, we need to calculate the GDP deflator. So that's why we were given the nominal GDP. So let's start by calculating those. Uh, those variables that we're going to use. And then we're going to move forward with log real GDP, log uh, real money, uh, money supply, and uh, interest rates. Uh, as, and those three variables are going to be the system uh, of BAR that, we, um, that we're going to analyze. So uh, I'm going to start by reading in the data, right? Here in line seven. You can see here we have GDP, real GDP, uh, money supply, and bond rates, uh, US Treasury bill rates, actually. And we have a variable called X that's empty. So we're going to just uh, uh, ignore it for the time being. Uh, let's capture the dates, right? 
the dates are in this variable called date all in capital letters. We can tell R that this is in format year quarterly, right? You can see here year dot quarter. So R will recognize that and will capture that information in a date. This could be useful for when we create any plots, uh, those labels in the plots uh, will be extracted from here. A uh, log of real GDP. Like you know how to calculate this, we grab the information from G real GDP and uh, uh, apply the log to it. Uh, the GDP deflator is calculated as the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP. So that's what we're going to do because the log of real money supply would be calculated as the log of the money supply minus the uh, GDP deflator. So we need that price here to be able to calculate this. And we're just going to rename the three month treasury bill rate and we're going to call it rates, RS. So it's just putting that information in that variable. Um, so yeah, let's just rename it. And uh, we're going to put the variables that we're going to work with. Ah, here, sorry. Yeah, GDP, uh, sorry, log real GDP, which I'm going to refer to as GDP from this point onwards because it's too long. Money supply and interest rates. We need to put all of them in the same in the same uh, data frame, which we're going to call X, because that's the the like excess in the BAR systems are um, like a variable that has the information from all the variables or the time series in the model, right? So from this point onwards, X is going to be what we're going to use to analyze. Um, right, I hope that's that's all good. Uh, let me know if you uh, are okay with this. This um, a little bit of a, you know the theoretical macro class that we uh, took or you should have taken beforehand, just how to calculate those uh, defl deflators and all of that. Uh, but now let's just go to the to our um, you know task at hand, which is how to select BAR models. So let's create a set and select from it. Um, we are going to, sell, to to consider up to 20 lakhs. So I'm going to create an empty list for the estimates of BAR. So that's line 18. I'm going to also create the, the usual uh, in, 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 I forgot. Um, uh, information criteria matrix, right? So I'm going to put all the, the all the information from the uh, AIC, BIC, and the lags of the BAR model in it. So I'm changing the names. All of this is empty. So we will fill that with the loop, right? We will uh, loop uh, the lags of the BAR model from one to 20. We'll start at one. We don't consider a uh, BAR zero. That's not uh, supported by the BAR package. Uh, BAR zero models. Like they do exist, but they are a, a special case. So something that is uh, um, out of um, out of scope from our work. So we are not going to worry about that uh, too much. So um, we're going to start from one to 20. Uh, estimate the BAR, so the syntax is from the BAR function in a uh, bars package. It's just where your system of variables is and the number of lags that you are selecting. And um, I'm capturing from that estimation, the AIC and BIC from, from that estimation of BAR. So I'm going to run the loop as a whole. So that's 21 to 25. Make sure that you grab the closing bracket and all. And as uh, you can see here, it calculated all of that without a problem. Uh, my estimates are in this long list. And the AIC and BIC are also 
a capture for every lag. So for BAR1, 2, until BAR20, right? So let's compare um, by ordering from um, like AIC and BIC, like we always do. Let me just switch to my slides, right? These are the models that are preferred by AIC in the first table and BIC in the second table. You probably noticed that the, the models are uh, agreeing that the, the first, the, the, the best models are two, three, and four. So we're going to work with those. And that is going to be our uh, adequate set. So I'm capturing the adequate set, the combinations, right? So I have two, three, and four, and uh, I'm capturing the indices for, for those um, for those uh, BAR models. So that's BAR2, BAR3, and BAR4. Uh, the, next, uh, the next step that we're going to do is check the residuals. We're going to uh, check them using a, um, a Lagrange multiplier test, uh, also known as the bruch Cost-Free test. Um, the, the usual check results of the Leon box test won't work. In this case, just so you guys remember, don't, don't, do, don't use the check residuals command, use serial test. Um, and type BG for Bruch Godfrey. Uh, so that will check the residuals. Um, I just created a small message. So the it, it shows me what BAR is checking, right? BAR two, three, or four, and to show me the results of the test. Um, actually, I summarized the results in here. So the, the null hypothesis of this Lagrange multiplier test is the same as before. The first lags of the residuals are correlated. Uh, wait, no, are not correlated. That's a typo, sorry. Let me just fix that because I don't want to be showing. Are not correlated, right? The All those uh, rows are equal to zero. So we are interested in uh, failing to reject this if we want to have good residuals. However, the results of the Lagrange multiplier test yield very low p-values. Therefore, um, these residuals are not okay. We need to go back in and select other models. Um, wait, before I forget, I wanted to mention something. Oh yeah, I remember. Uh, I did had to change a little bit, uh, whoops, a little bit of this code here, because I was having a bit issues, a, a little bit of an issue with Eric's code. So I'm going to reach out to him to tell him that. Uh, this code will work, I uh, had to change it. Uh, wait, no, no, sorry, not that, this, I think. Yeah, this. So uh, yeah, it, it will, when you are, um, when you are, um, sorry, if you are ever needing to make this code um, your own, uh, please come to consultation. I will tell you because in here I'm I'm doing I'm I'm using a loop from two to four because the models are actually BAR two, three, and four, so they are consecutive. That was easy, but if they weren't, I don't know if it was BAR one, three, five, and eight, or something like that, then uh, something a little bit different would have been needed. But I can show you how to do that uh, without a problem. So. It, it, this code, I mean, it's not as it's not as replicable as all of them, but it's not like the change is not too dramatic. Um, all righty. So the first models that we selected did not work. So if you check the AIC and BIC, do you notice that the other models, are other than the first three, are also low lag numbers? Like uh, the higher in this case would be 11, they go pretty much from five to 10, five to 11. So that's, a, that's, um, that's an indication that these tests, uh, like the preference for the BAR models are like the lower the lags, the better. 
So what we're going to do now is to check the residuals for all the 20 lag models. Let's see which residuals work for us. And based on that uh, selection criteria that we just discovered that the lower the lags, the better, we will come up with a, with a second set of models for our analysis. And I also had to change this code. This code is also my own. Um, I think it's in code. Yeah, it's in code share. I, I copied and pasted all of that. Yeah, it's in code share. So yeah, um, it, it will, again, it, it will need a little bit of work if you were to, um, <clears throat> sorry, if you were to adapt this code. But uh, what I'm going to do is to um, perform the tests for all the 20 models, capture the p-values, and put the p-values in a matrix next to the number of lags. That way I can compare, like from the lags 1 to 20, how the p-values look like to see if we will uh, reject or fail to reject uh, the white noise residuals assumption. Um, in here, I'm just doing the test and capture the p-values in this uh, matrix. And then I'm just, um, I'm actually printing the test results as well. So we will get all of it. So let me just wipe my results in here and run lines 41 to 48. And here we have the, all the test results starting from BAR1 very low p-values and they will start increasing a little bit uh, until they will reach a point where they are uh, actually good which are, which is from BAR8 onwards so if you look at the matrix that I generated um, you can see that all these values are very low 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 until we reach BAR8 at that point this is higher than 0 0.05 so that will be all right and um and yeah, so let me go back to this. And um, again, since these models prefer the lower the lag uh, values, the better, we will go with lags a a BAR 8, 9, and 10. Even if we need to be a little bit flexible here with the BAR 10, because it's 0 0.05 if it's approximated, but um, uh, it's up to you. Like if you are asked to do this in a report, you can. If this was a case, you can say, okay, eight, nine, and eleven. That will that will be your fine, uh, and avoid ten. That will also be valid. Uh, in this case, we are choosing to be flexible. I think it's for simplicity on the loops. But again, all of these can be uh, adapted, so don't be afraid of doing that. So um, just close this. All right, so we are going to move forward with 8, 9, and 10 as the adequate set. So let's select that, like select the adequate set and the and the may uh, in the indices uh, for for estimation later. So we are going with VAR 8, 9, and 10. Uh, next question is uh, uh, mentioning how many intercept and slope coefficients need to be estimated for each BAR in the adequate set. This is because BAR uh, uh, models are quite massive, right? Actually, I do have a slide just to show you, but this is extra, so it's not going to be in the... Sorry. It's not going to be... Uh, like it's not, let me just close that, just to show you how a BAR system will look like. Um, wait, let me find it in here really quickly. If you look at this slide, um, this would be the three um, the three variables that we have: GDP, uh, money supply, and interest rates, um, and how they are put in the same system and explained by lags of itself. Like those are the reds uh, for Y, the blues for U, and the greens for R, and lags of the other variables. 
And those three equations, which are quite massive, are explained uh, simultaneously. So this is a BAR10. That's what we have up to 10 lakhs. And as you can see, we have a lot of uh, uh, coefficients here. So um, yeah, just, to, just for visibility, you will, I don't think you'll be asked to like expand the model to this detail. I'm going to come back to this uh, because this used to be a question in this tutorial, how to uh, obtain the companion form BAR. It's not a question here, but I just put it, I just left it in the slides just to show you in case, I don't know, in case it's asked, it's asked in an exam or something. So I'm going to come back to this, uh, but I just wanted to show you like how many uh, coefficients are actually in a, in a BAR10 model. So instead of having to count in all of that, um, we have a formula. Uh, hang on one second. We have a formula, which is N, it's whatever number of uh, variables we have in the system, and P, whatever number of lags in the BAR uh, model. And we can like use these to calculate how many intersects we have in BAR 8, 9, and 10. So let's do that with R. Um, we do this with a small loop, uh, just uh, doing the operation and printing the result, number of uh, variables in the BAR system, which is the number of columns in X, right? We have three variables here. So that's the uh, number of variables in the system. Uh, how many models we have? Well, the adequate set has three models. So we will have BAR, um, sorry, the loop will run through three different specifications, BAR 8, 9, and 10. That's uh, what it's um, looping in here. So let's run this loop. And with the paste zero, uh, you will get like this, uh, like this uh, messages there, which are quite easy to, 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 uh, to understand, right? Uh, and um, like a little bit on the on the uh, programming, if you if you are interested in, base zero will put both text and numbers or variables in the same string of text. Uh, anything that you want as text, you you put in quote marks and you separate items by commas. So I want this this um, I want this text. Then I want this value. Then I want this text. Then this operation, I can also program operations, and then this uh, other text to, to close the, 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 the string of characters. Uh, so that way we can create this, um, this text. But coming back to the question, you can see that they are quite massive. The one that I just showed you had 93 coefficients. So all those alphas, all those betas, and all those gammas, uh, all uh, added up together is 93. Uh, even BAR8 already has 75 coefficients. So it's a lot to, to, to be estimated. Luckily, R do that for us. And um, luckily also, uh, they are generated simultaneously. So uh, it's usually a very uh, efficient uh, system. All righty. So we selected the number of... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I know a subset of models. We checked the residuals, we're good so far. The next step is to check the stability of the BAR model, right? So how do we check the stability of the model? Uh, we take the model, we transform it to companion form. I'm going to show you kind of how that's done, but when you um, transform it to, to to companion form, you get a system that looks like this, right? With all your variables here, your intersects, your coefficients, your lag values, and the error terms. Um, well, if you take this huge matrix that's called A tilde, and you calculate the eigenvalues of that, of that matrix, if those eigenvalues are all lower than one in absolute value, uh, that way we can uh, confirm the stability of the BAR model. So just a question for you guys to always remember, why is companion form useful? Because from the companion form, we take this matrix, we calculate the eigenvalues, and it's a way to calculate the stability or to determine the stability of the model quite straightforwardly, all right? 
So please, please remember that just in case. Uh, so we can do that. Let's um, let's check the stability of the model. For that, we're going to use the uh, function called roots in the BARS package. Uh, so it's just a matter of finding which eigenvalue is the maximum for this set of roots because it's uh, it will calculate a, a, a large sequence of roots. Uh, since we are interested in just like all of them being lower than one, let's just grab the largest and see if the largest is lower than one, everything is all right. Um, and yeah, this loop will create again this little text that will tell us uh, what is the maximum eigenvalue for BAR8, 9, and 10. And unfortunately, they are all barely over one, which is not great. Um, um, that, that's not great, meaning that these three models are not stable. So uh, at, at this point, you might be tempted to go back and select more different models, check residuals, and come back and check stability. But uh, for the sake of this week's uh, tutorial, uh, let's overlook this. Um, of course, this will mean like if the system is not stable, then the forecasting will not be too reliable at longer horizons. This is something to remember. Uh, and we are going to see next week how to impose impose that restriction on exact uh, uh, on exact unit in here. So we're going to do that next week. For now, let's just um, overlook this fact and move uh, forward to forecasting, which I think is the next question. Let's forecast for 12 quarters past the end of the sample, so 12 quarters in the future. This is quarterly data, so this will be four years in the future, which is kind of a mid-run mid, uh, mid uh, run, uh, uh, term. So it, it, it's, uh, it's not too long, so our uh, estimates should not be too, too weird. And, and along with the 95% predictive intervals. So this is kind of the harder, the, the, yeah, the longest loop that we're going to learn today. So I'm going to go through it step by step. The first thing that we do is to set the horizon. Uh, we want 12 uh, periods in the future, and we store that in a variable here. Uh, we are creating an empty list to store the forecasts. With xlim and ylim, we are going to uh, set the set the the limits of the plot that we are going to generate. This plot is not going to include all the information. We are just going to uh, select. Uh, like I think it, this is set by Eric, so I think I don't think this should be changed by you. But what it's saying is that it will start at a point. Uh, uh, sorry, so how many points we have in date? Let me check. So that's 169. So minus three, so moving um, three points ahead and then multiplied by the horizon. So, it, I mean, what we're doing here, it's um, also giving some space for, for the horizon. So the important bit is what's after the comma. So it's how many points we have in, in, in like observed so far, which is 169 plus the horizon. So that's the end point of the plot. The start point of the plot is set with this, which is kind of to kind of zoom in a little bit, not to show the whole plot, but zooming in. We have 169 uh, quarters. That's a lot of uh, data. So it's just zooming in there. Uh, and uh, this is the limit of the vertical axis. Um, the only thing to mind here is to give it a little bit of um, a little bit of height, the, a maximum height, because you probably uh, guess that these uh, economic variables they usually go like following a trend. So uh, if we are going to keep adding more, it's probably going to follow that trend. So it's going to go up. So we need to uh, um, prepare for that elevation there. 
Uh, of course, this is due to the scale of the variable uh, log real GDP. But if, if you're working uh, like on your own work, you can play around with this uh, in, and find out how much, how much you need to add. So I'm going to delete this for now and show you what I mean by that. And then we are looping through the selected set of models, uh, which is three. Uh, I'm capturing what is the index for that model. Uh, sorry, yeah, what, what is the lag length? So eight, nine, and 10, estimating uh, the VAR and then predicting with uh, at 12 points of the horizon that I set here in the future. And I'm just giving, uh, like I'm plotting it. And with this, I'm just, you know, giving names to the labels, name to the plot, and um, setting the limits for X and Y to the limits that we previously created. And uh, and this is the name of the, I think, um, a, a, a values in the axis, in the horizontal axis, I think. So let's run all of these. And this is what I mean. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, displaying the whole 169 values. You see how it starts at 130 or so. So that's the zooming in that's done with this. Uh, and we need to give a little bit of um, space on the top to fit all of this. So in here, you can play around with this. Uh, you can add one, for example, and run all of these again. You know, hey, no, that's too much. So maybe half of it. Uh, oops. Sorry, I, I should run it again. Yeah, still too much. So um, with 0 0.2, it, it's enough, right? So that's what I mean by play around it in order to your graph, uh, for your graph to be nice. If you still think that that's too much, maybe you can go to 15 and rerun that in, eh, you know, point, uh, with two is, it, with point two, it's fine, but that's, uh, what I mean by that when you're creating your plots. Uh, so we have the, actually I created like a million. Let me just wipe them and run it again. We created forecasts for VAR8, VAR9 and VAR10. You can notice how the forecasts are very similar, right? The, this forecast seems to be uh, robust, which is good. Um, and also, uh, looks like our, I mean, two things. The predictive intervals become larger as the future progress. That means that, of course, uh, uh, it, the uncertainty increases as we move forward further in the future, which is what we always have. Uh, but even if our systems are not stable, those predictive intervals don't go like crazy. They don't explode from the top or the bottom, which is good. Um, so our prediction is still OK, even if you're going quite a bit far in the future. But we, um, um, so let me check my notes just here. Actually, I, I, I put them all in the same slide just so we can compare all of them in here. So our results are a robust to specification, robust to model, which is okay. And um, and yeah, the, the predictive intervals don't go haywire. So that means that uh, the uncertainty is uh, somehow captured by the model. So this is the one flexibility that the VAR models uh, provide. And they are quite, quite accurate. Um, so yeah, if they are planned uh, correctly, they, they are very powerful. All righty, let me just stop here to see if you guys have any questions. We want to double check something. Um, if you want me to repeat anything, please let me know. Okay, everything seems all right. All right, I brought this little extra. Uh, this is not in the questions. This is not going to be in the solutions. This is just something I wanted to bring just in case you were asked how to create or how to convert to a to a companion form. Um, uh, wait, hang on. Okay, 
So the BAR form, uh, the, the BAR, we, we start from a BAR, let's say BAR 10. So a BAR 10 system, uh, oh, this is in, in, in the incorrect order, it looks something like this, right? You remember that X uh, is the, the object that has our three time series contained, right? And it's explained by lags of those variables uh, up to 10, right? And we give uh, also, since this is not a, it's not a unidimensional time series, but we have three. So that's why I put everything in, 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 in capital letters to signal that these are not uh, vectors, these are matrices. The way they look like is something like this. So this is xt, this is a zero, a one, xt minus one. And, you know, I skipped uh, eight of these and then go straight to the 10th with the 10th lag. So the way that these um, subscripts work is that these first two are the position in the matrix, right? So this is row one, column, column one, row one, column two, row one, column three, up to, you know, row three, column two, row three, column three. And after the comma is to which lag it corresponds. They are the coefficients for the first lag of X uh, so that's what they, the comma one after, right? If you check the, the 10, it's the same. Row one, column one, row one, column two, and all of these are for the 10th lag of XT. So that way we can uh, locate them um, uh, quite easily. That's so good, I'm glad. Uh, alrighty, so let's, um, yeah. So this is the system, like when we open the matrices. Uh, oops, this slide is in, in, in the incorrect order. Just so you guys know, uh, I, I call GDP Y, money supply U and our interest rates R. This is R, not Y, sorry. Uh, just for short, because otherwise that will be too long to type. Now, if you operate the matrices, you can actually get how the system would look like equation by equation, right? You go row by row. So YT equals alpha one zero, plus alpha one, one, one times y t minus one, plus alpha one, two, one times u t minus one, plus alpha one, three, one times r t minus one, then for minus two, minus three, minus four, da, 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 until minus 10, which is alpha one, one, 10 times this, plus alpha one, two, 10 times this, plus alpha one, three, 10 times this, plus a, a, e one t. Right, so that's the first row. The second row will be the same, but from UT and the third row for RT. Uh, if you expand the expressions, this is how they would look like, but um, like, you know, behind all of these uh, dots in here, uh, if you expand that, that's how they will look like. I'm gonna leave that there if you want to review. Uh, but, the way that we're going to do this to transform into companion form, the idea behind this is to take a BAR10, for example, and transform it into an equivalent companion form, which is a BAR1 model, a much simpler model. So um, everything before was just to explain how the BAR10 looks like, but from this point, you take the BAR10, all of this in matrix form, and you add and you put it into a system with another nine auxiliary identities. I put nine because we have a BAR10. If we had BAR5, I would add four more auxiliary identities, right? Until I have 10 uh, items in the system, okay? Auxiliary identities mean that just uh, the uh, lags of the uh, XT matrix multiplied by an identity matrix. And this three is given by the number of items in X. X has three variables. So that's why the, um, the identity matrix that will, will be multiplied by, it, it's of a dimension three. So what we do is that we stack the matrix in the system, right? We have in the first row, the whole um, uh, BAR10 model, which is XT equals alpha zero, 
sorry, A0 plus A1, XT minus one, plus A2, XT minus two, blah, 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 until A10, XT minus 10 plus ET. So that first row corresponds, sorry, to this, right? The second row, you guys remember uh, XT minus one equals identity XT minus one. So if you go here, you go XT minus one equals zero plus identity times XT minus one plus zero times this plus zero times this plus zero times this. So nothing else plus zero. So that way we put all of these, like the whole BAR model 10 into the same system with the auxiliary identities. And we get to this, uh, to this system of equations in matrix form. It's just a matter of giving them names and calling this big as uh, XT matrix as XT tilde with all the XTs up to nine lakhs of itself. Um, of course, these are matrices on top of matrices, so they are stacked. They look something like this, like variable XT, UT and RT then in first lakhs, then in second lakhs, oh, sorry, it's a two here, my bad, up to nine lakhs, right? So it's a long, a long matrix there. Um, this A0 will have the coefficients of the initial uh, BAR10 model and zeros afterwards. This big matrix will have, and I already showed you these uh, items here. These are the coefficients for, um, for the BAR10 at first lag, second lag, and up to nine. I'm sorry, this is incomplete. So these are nine lags, and this is 10. Uh, my bad with the, with the, with the uh, subscript, sorry about that. But all the coefficients are here, and you can see that our, along the diagonal, we have the, the, um, the identity matrices of dimension three in here. Uh, xt tilde minus one looks something like this, and the errors look something like this. Now, the usefulness of this BAR uh, in companion form is that this, uh, this equation has all the information that the BAR10 model has, right? So it's uh, everything is in there. We have not like missed any information, but it's a much simpler model. And when we calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix A1 tilde, we can assess if the system is, um, is stable or not. So it's just a little bit extra. Oh, okay, yeah, so the, this BAR10 model is equivalent to this uh, BAR1 companion form model. It's a little extra, I wanted, and especially I wanted to leave it in the recording. So if you wanna come back to it, or maybe, I don't know, it's asked in, you want to prepare for your final, whatever, uh, it, it, the resource is there for you. So just wanted to leave you a little bit extra here. But uh, it's not, as as I know so far, you like, I don't know if you were asked to, re to reproduce this, but just so you know how it, where it comes from. All righty, let's move to question two. In question two, we're going to analyze the dynamic relationships between the variables in the system. Uh, since this process is quite extensive, we're going to move forward with BAR8, okay? We're going to um, uh, use that as our preferred model. Otherwise, this process will be too long going, doing it from eight, nine, and 10. So that's okay. Um, in question A actually says, using the Koleski decomposition, compute the impulse response functions for all the possible orderings of the system and study the responses. Are the responses sensitive to ordering? Choose the most reasonable ordering and explain your answer. So what's the Koleski decomposition? Well, Koleski decomposition orders all the variable in the system according of how the shocks are transmitted, okay? Uh, you guys remember, sorry, I skipped that. You guys remember what the IRFs are, right? They describe how a variable changes uh, in, in response to a shock in other variable, uh, you know, over time after the shock. So it starts at the moment that the shock occurs and how it will change, like if it will increase after the shock or decrease after the shock um, and all of that. Uh, all right, so uh, the default 
setting for, for this transmission of shocks in a VAR system is with the Koleski decomposition. The Koleski decomposition, uh, like I was mentioning, order the variable according how the shocks are transmitted. So the variable order first will only respond to shocks to itself contemporaneously, right? After the shock occurs, it, it will uh, um, change uh, at some future point, right? But only to itself. For example, if a shock occurs in the variable that's ordered second or third, those shocks do not have an contemporaneous, so don't have an immediate effect on the variable order first. But when the variable order first shocks, then it will change uh, contemporaneously variables order first, second, and third. Okay. The variable order second only responds to shocks to the variable order first but not to the variable order third. And the variable order third responds to shocks to all the variables, first, second, and itself. Um, I hope that wasn't too convoluted. Um, it's just, uh, it's just uh, um, yeah, I, I think that's the, like the uh, most straightforward way that I found to, to explain how this Koleski decomposition works. Uh, there are other ways to, trans to transmit these shocks but they are out of scope for this uh, tutorial, so we're not going to discuss that. All right. Um, of course, we need to decide what the order will be appropriate, right? We'll watch which variable will be ordered first, second, and third, uh, because that way we can uh, paint a better picture of how these shocks are transmitted. So let me uh, actually we need to generate those plots that I was showing, but this is going to be a little bit complicated in the sense that, um, well, we're going to create the IRFs. There is an IRF function in the bars, uh, like in, we estimate the bar and then we calculate the IRFs depending on the orders. So what's the response and what's the impulse? Um, So we are going to plot those IRFs. This bit here is just to give a name to the plot. Let me just wipe my plotting here. It's just to give a name. Uh, this message here, this cat command, will show us which uh, plot is being produced. We did this uh, two weeks ago when we um, you remember that the plot takes a lot of time, so it's showing which model is being estimated. So that's what we're doing with this. Uh, but the important bit here is orders. So orders will find the possible um, permutations of the com of combinations from one to three. Why is that? Because we want to select which models, like we, we need to be exhaustive on this, like all the possible orderings that variables one, two, and three will have. So GDP, money supply, and interest rates. Right? So all the possible combinations that they can be in. Um, and well, uh, permutations will do that for us. For example, uh, we will assume that order one will be variable uh, re interest rates, um, money supply, and GDP. Interest rates, GDP, money supply. Money supply, interest rates, GDP. Money supply, GDP, interest rates. Uh, GDP, money supply, interest rates, GDP, interest rates, money supply. So all of the possible orderings that uh, these three variables can have, we're going to go through all those orderings. And we're going to compare. Uh, so this code, if your system is composed by three variables, the model doesn't need to, the code doesn't need to be changed. I'll just run it because it, in my computer, it's going to take a minute. But um, uh, but yeah, it, it's creating the, imp the, the IRFs there for each of the particular cases. Um, if you have more than three, you will need to change these uh, loops in here. Um, I also captured the names of the variables in here because it's going to use those names uh, as the reference for the response and the impulse that we need in the IRFs. So let's just give it a minute. 
for it to produce, it had to produce nine times six, that's 54 plots. So it's going to take a second to do that. Of course, in some of your computers, uh, might have really might already be finished, but let's just be patient for mine, please. Actually, in the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, please fire away. We can discuss that while my models are estimated, my, my graphs are estimated. Uh, oh, it's finished. That's good. All right. So as you can see, 54 graphs, uh, it seems that they are all over the place. Let me just pick the first one to show you how they work. My goodness. OK. so. Uh, the first one shows how GDP responds to a shock to itself, considering uh, or assuming this order. In this order, interest rates are ordered first, money supply are ordered second, and GDP is ordered third. Of course, uh, it doesn't really matter where GDP is explained. It's ordered when like, finding the response to shocks to itself, because it will always respond like all the variables will always respond to shocks to itself contemporaneously. So that's why the first shock is not at zero, but it's here. Um, but uh, for example, let me find one that's actually set to be zero. This one, for example, this is showing how GDP responds to a shock in money supply. However, GDP is order uh, before money supply. So uh, the Koleski decomposition, the way it's programmed, it will assume that the shock, like the contemporaneous shock, uh, it will be zero. So that's why it's bound to be zero at first. But then after a few periods, the, the, like after this, the first period onwards, the shock will be transmitted and eventually will you know, follow its course. Um, so in this case, uh, GDP will increase and then will eventually become a, or go to a lower level than it started. So I put all these graphs in these uh, slides according to the orderings. These slides are these slides were a little bit tricky to put together because um, they are not like. For example, they are not the first nine graphs to be generated, then the second nine. The way R will uh, produce these graphs is this one first. So all the responses of GDP to shocks to GDP for order one, for order two, for order three, four, five, and six. And then uh, this one, sorry, went too far. Uh, this one for order one, two, three, four, and five, and six, and then uh, this. So it will start with this, and then this, then this, da, 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 for all the six orderings. But I put, a, I put them by orders here to show you uh, how the assumptions are transmitted. For example, the first permutation we have is interest rates first, money supply second, GDP third, right? Uh, we assume that uh, GDP, a response to shocks on the others, but interest rates nor a money supply response contemporaneously to shocks to GDP. So you can see here, um, what is it? Um, here, 
how interest rates, sorry, interest rates and money supply response to shock in GDP. And they are all, both of these graphs are bound to start at zero, right? GDP suffers a shock, interest rates do not respond immediately, but they will eventually increase, right? And money supply, same. GDP shocks, money supply does not uh, respond at first, but then it will increase and then it will start slowly, slowly, slowly coming back to the original level. The same here, uh, money, uh, interest rates are ordered before money supply. So that's why at the point where money supply shocks, interest rates don't change, but eventually it will start increasing and then it will start decreasing until I think it will eventually reach the initial level that it had. So um, the values in the axis are changes. So it, for example, increased by 0 0.1, increased by 0 0.2. Uh, but of course, it will when it reaches back to zero means that it will increase by zero, something like that. So it will it, it will be uh, come back to the, ori the original level that it had. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because the way that we choose an ordering, uh, it can be done by comparing the order the, the graphs like this grid of graphs one by one. Uh, but we are not going to do that because that's that's pretty much. Um, that's not recommendable because you will have to compare like six graphs and then all again all combinations of those six so it's a mess what i can tell you though is that we can draw an appropriate ordering of the variables from economic theory the way we do this is that we separate the variables into those that are policy and non-policy right so we have gdp we have money supply and we have interest rates. From those variables, only interest rates is a policy rate. The others are not, right? So policy rates will be ordered last. That's from the theory. And the non-policy variables are separated into variables that move fast and variables that move slow. For example, a fast moving uh, um, a variable correspond usually to financial indicators, right? Do you remember those for the from the stock market? Uh, Standard & Poor's, five, uh, yeah, 500, uh, NASDAQ, none of those. They are usually, they, they usually respond faster. Those markets, financial markets respond faster. Real economic activities is slower to react. So GDP and money supply will fall into this category. Um, so, um, I, I put economic theory twice, sorry, but yeah. Building on that, on that idea, inflation and unemployment, for example, will react to a policy instrument with at least one period of lag. Uh, sorry, infl not, neither inflation or unemployment, but in this case, GDP and money supply, sorry, I, I, I forgot to, to change this to, to the new variables. So GDP and a, a money supply will react to to, um, to, to changes in policy, at least one period, right? It, the, this transmission of policy, of monetary policy is not immediate. It takes a while, right? Our only policy variable is interest rates, so they will be ordered last, right? Uh, a shock to, in, to, to interest rates will not affect either GDP or money supply immediately, but it will eventually, uh, at least with one period, it will affect. But we don't know uh, how to order GDP and money supply because they are both real economic activity variables. So between the two of them, we do need to choose which order will be more appropriate. So for that, we're going to use the graphs. But we're only doing this uh, when we at least located one variable. We know that interest rates should be ordered last so the only two possible options is that either GDP comes first and money supply comes second or money supply comes first and GDP comes second. Now, all of these graphs are going to be, sorry, are going to be the same except for these four. Um, in this case, we are assuming that a money supply responds to shocks of GDP contemporaneously. Uh, 
in this case, we don't, right? Because money supply is ordered first than GDP. So the response to, of money supply to a shock of GDP takes a, at least one period. So that's why it's said to be zero. And in this case, the response of GDP to change in money supply is said to be zero because GDP is ordered first than money supply. So what you do is that you compare like in pairs, this red graph with this red graph and the yellow graph with the yellow graph. And you will see which one will lose more dynamic uh, for that uh, assumption to be set than zero. And as you can see, these graphs are very similar. Like even if you don't uh, set these initial values to be zero, the variables are very, very similar. So um, at this point, uh, whatever order that you choose, either four or five would be okay because the graphs don't change too much, right? Uh, if you find, for example, that this is the how the graph looks like when you set this initial value to be equal to zero. And then it looks like this, for example, when you don't set it to be zero, uh, but these two are that similar, then you might say, okay, this order might be better because leaving this to do not be set to zero brings more information to the model than when we do. And if we set this one to be zero, we don't lose that much information. That's the way that this analysis is, 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 is done. But um, in this case, they, are, they look very similar. Um, I'll be probably tempted or, or more lean towards order four because the difference in the initial level in here is higher. So I think that might be the best, but it's, it, it really is indifferent. Whatever model, uh, whatever ordering you, you feel like it's the best, it, it's the one that you should use. Now, uh, for the next question, we're going to um, analyze this dynamic, uh, sorry, analyze the forecast error variance decompositions. So from my understanding is that having an order chose, chosen from the previous question, we use that ordering to, to compute these graphs. Uh, so let's actually produce the graphs and I'll come back to this. So um, we will produce the, the estimates from the fact, uh, what was the forecast error variance decomposition. We're going to uh, obtain the values and then we are going to plot. Uh, we are going to use BAR8, uh, a forecast of 40 in the future. Um, wait, what is it? 40 points in the future. I think that's the default. Let me see. Yeah, I think that's the default for the for the shocks in the impulse response function. So it will go and see up to 40 periods in the future. So we keep that consistent. And we put the plot and we display the plot. This margin and uh, outer margin area is just for you to play around to your graph to make it more visible. Let me just do this, FEVD uh, estimates, and let me just plot this. So I'm going to put a parenthesis here and just run this little bit to show you that it looks kind of bad, right? So uh, by changing these margins, which is the margin of the plots and auto margin areas, the margin of the, uh, of the whole, like the complete thing, changing it, it will give you like a better, better visuals. So let me just delete this parenthesis and let me show you now how it will rescale. So this is for a rescaling here. Um, of course, if the scales of the variables when you are doing this, it's different than you have to do this kind of bit of trial and error. The default of course is all of these are zero, 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 zero. Uh, the first number corresponds to the bottom um, margin. The next one is the left margin. This is the top margin and this is the right margin. So I leave that uh, like that reference for you guys, uh, because if you do something and you present something like this, this is not informative at all. So it's, it, it's better just to change that and make it more visible. But again, trial and error, it's, it's uh, what I can tell you here. And we will obtain these three 
factor, uh, sorry, forecast error variance decompositions for the three variables, GDP, money supply, and interest rates. So let me go back, show you here. Now these FEVDs show what's the proportion of the variation in a time series uh, due to exogenous shocks to itself versus exogenous shocks to the other variables. For example, GDP at first only um, like the fluctuation um, in that variable only comes from shocks to itself. You can see that the darker gray here is GDP, but eventually um, <clears throat> money supply shocks start to be um, uh, start to be more visible, uh, kind of after one year, so eight uh, eight, eight quarters. Yeah, after that it starts to be to become more visible, um, and this is proportion. So for example, let's take uh, 20 in the future, which would be this one. 20 periods in the future, uh, approximately 40% of the fluctuation of GDP is caused by shocks in money supply. Uh, I would dare to say 20% by shocks in monetary policy and another 40% of shocks to itself, right? So that's how, and the shock occurring at time zero. So that's how that shock and how that, uh, what's the produced fluctuation from that shock after it occurs. Uh, for money supply, at first, uh, it, it will only like respond to shocks, uh, like the fluctuation in money supply will only be caused by shocks in money supply. Eventually, um, interest rates will cause a larger proportion of the variation but it will start to decrease after a little bit. And um, in the medium and in, in the medium term and long run, uh, the, the variation or, or the fluctuation in money supply will start being uh, explained by shocks in GDP it, to an increasingly higher till eventually will reach kind of approximately 50% uh, are caused by, by GDP. Oops, sorry. And uh, interest rates, they don't seem to respond to shocks in, in uh, sorry, the fluctuation of interest rates do not seem to respond to shocks in GDP and money supply so much uh, because the, um, like, sorry, because uh, as you probably guys remember, interest rates, uh, they are usually what cause the, the like, like they are ordered last, right? So the other variables, um, like, wait, let me rephrase this. Interest rates are a policy, a monetary policy variable. So usually it will cause the fluctuations, but not respond too much to it, from it. Uh, so at first, like it, it's usually, it, it most of the time is constant. Uh, my best guess would be like, this would be like 90%. So 90% of the fluctuation of uh, interest rates would be caused by shocks on itself and probably 5% and 5% due to the others until it eventually uh, probably goes down to 80% of the fluctuation of interest rates are caused by itself and the other 20 pretty much by GDP, not much, no, almost not at all by money. Uh, uh, money supply. So that's how this uh, forecast error variance decomposition uh, graphs look like, uh, work. And the last bit that we're going to do today is to obtain the, like to infer on the Granger causality among these variables. Granger causality is an interesting test because we can determine if a variable, uh, sorry, if a variable improves forecasts uh, uh, when used to explain the other variable in the system. So we have GDP, money supply, and interest rates in the system. We can see from one to the others if this variable, for example, improves forecasts in money supply and interest rates, 
if money supply improves forecasts on GDP and interest rates, and if interest rates improves forecasts in GDP and money supply. That's called Granger causality. So when we say GDP Granger causes money supply, means that having GDP in the same model as money supply produces better forecasts for money supply. So of course, finding at least one of the variables to Granger cost the others would be a good reason or, or good evidence uh, for this BAR model. That it, it's good that we put the that variable in the model because it improves the forecasts that we that, that we can get uh, on the other variables. Uh, then the null hypothesis for this Granger test is that the excluded or the analyzed variable does not Granger cause the other variables. So we are going to um, test that null hypothesis. The command is called causality. Uh, uh, you guys remember that we had the combinations for the names. So these are variable names that we have here. So we can, again, use those combinations here for um, like the, yeah, we, we will, uh, we will loop through the three variables and we will see if that variable Granger causes, like the first variable Granger causes second and third, the second variable Granger causes, Granger causes first and third, and the third variable will Granger cause first and second. So we loop through those three combinations and um, we do the causality test. So again, this code will be replicable for you, no, no problems there. And um, from the causality, the item Granger will have the results of the test. So let me, I, I put everything in here so we can see the conclusions. The first is that the, the first null hypothesis you get that message in here is that GDP do not Granger cause or do not improve forecasts on money supply and interest rates and that uh, null hypothesis is, the, is um, rejected. So, GDP improves forecasts on a money supply or interest rates or both. We, we don't get enough information to go in there, but at least to one of these, it will improve forecasts. So that's good. It, it, it's an, it, it's uh, an, that variable brings a um, ex good explanatory power for the others in the model. The second model, we will fail to reject that money supply do not Granger cost GDP and uh, interest rates. So we don't have enough evidence to confirm that it Granger causes or that it do not Granger cost uh, uh, interest rates or GDP or both. Uh, but interest rates, interest rates do explain um, uh, or improve the forecasts of GDP and money supply. This uh, notion is actually supported uh, mainly by this and these FEVDs. You can see how money supply, like the explanation of the fluctuation of GDP and interest rates is not particularly big. So yeah, it's not explaining much of the fluctuation, therefore it's not uh, improving the forecasts of GDP and interest rates. But uh, 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 interest rates do improve forecasts and GDP as well. So that's uh, overall, it's, I mean, it, it's the way it is. It doesn't mean that uh, money supply should be excluded from the model, not, not, not like that. Um, but it does help you, uh, like if you're interested in seeing uh, if, I don't know if your model is too big and you want to cut the, um, uh, the, the models that are not being very useful for a particular variable. Remember our variable of interest in this case was GDP. So yeah, we might consider um, uh, taking it out of the system, but um, with, with a system uh, like as small as this one, it's not, uh, 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 it's not necessary to exclude it, so it's it's fine. All right, guys, um, that's all we had for this week. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Let me just copy the codes 
one last time there for you in case you didn't get them. I will upload the my, my R script and the recording uh, during the weekend, probably. So in case you want to double check this. I will just uh, hang around for a little bit if you have any questions. Uh, just uh, uh, as a heads up, next week I'm going to be asking you guys if you can please uh, provide me with feedback on my work. So I will bring the links. They're not ready yet. They should be ready during the weekend. Uh, and ask you to fill that out. I would really appreciate it. But for now, um, just enjoy your weekend. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for stopping by, for your attention. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys next week. The markings for project one are still uh, a work in progress. So please don't uh, worry too much about that. Probably next week or the week after that, it will be ready. Um, and. I think project two has already been up, uh, uploaded. So please stop by and give it a look and start working on it. All right, that's all for me. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day.